What tests should you consider getting for osteoporosis? Also, what do they mean and how are they helpful? Today, we're gonna to talk about bone markers, what some of the most common tests are, what they show, and how they're helpful for understanding bone health. Hello, my friends. I'm Sarah, and I'm a nutritional health coach through the Institute for Integrated Nutrition. I'm also a BoneFit certified fitness instructor and a 500 hour trained yoga teacher with additional training that's specific for osteoporosis and yoga. I'm on a mission to reduce the number of osteoporotic fractures that happen each year. And I'm glad to have you join me in the journey to better bone health. As a health coach, I get asked about bone marker tests really regularly. I'm not a doctor, so my perspective in sharing about these tests today is not to share how they work or the science behind them, but rather it's my goal to share what a regular person should know and understand about what these tests mean, what they measure, and how they can help us to better understand our bone health and determine what we choose to do in the future. Bone marker tests are generally separated into two categories, bone formation and bone resorption, which is also known as bone breakdown. These tests are done either in, on our blood or our urine. First, let's go over two commonly used tests for measuring bone formation. And let me just say that bone formation is exciting. I like bone building. The first test on our list is the osteocalcin test. Osteocalcin is a protein that helps our bodies to build and maintain our bones. The osteocalcin test is a blood test. When you hear the word serum with medical tests, it generally refers to blood work. The serum is actually the clear part that's left over after blood cells and proteins have been removed. But for our purposes, when you hear a medical provider talk about serum levels, it's helpful to know that they're talking about things that they're measuring from our blood work. Osteocalcin measures activity for osteoblasts, which are our bone building cells. It also measures the speed at which new bone is forming. If you've had an osteocalcin test done, a normal range for postmenopausal women is between 13 and 25.6 nanograms per milliliter. If your osteocalcin level is too high, it can indicate bone loss, and if it's too low, it can indicate that bone's not forming properly. If you find that your results are not in the normal range, it's important to ask your doctor what's happening and why, and if there's anything that you can do about it. If you choose to have an osteocalcin test, there are some things that you should do to prepare for it in advance. For the 12 hours before your test, avoid taking multivitamins of supplements that have biotin or vitamin B7 in them. For the 10 to 12 hours before, also avoid eating foods that are high in biotin, things like legumes, nuts, seeds, mushrooms, avocados, sweet potatoes, and organ meat. This means that it's a good idea to schedule the test first thing in the morning and to go in for your test fasting. The second bone formation test on our list today is the P1NP, which is also known as the pro-collagen type 1 N-terminal pro-peptide. The full name for this test includes the word collagen, and as its name implies, this test measures how much type 1 collagen is forming. Type 1 collagen is an important part of the collagen that gives our bones structure and flexibility. P1NP gets released into the bloodstream when new collagen is formed in our bodies. The normal range for a postmenopausal woman for a P1NP test is between 10.4 and 97.8 nanograms per milliliter. The P1NP test is a blood test that's measured by serum. Our bone markers tend to change throughout the day, and for the sake of consistency, it's recommended to take a P1NP first thing in the morning. Fasting for this test may or may not be required, so check with your doctor first on this one. Also, you may need to stop taking supplements or other medication before taking this test, so check with your medical provider ahead of time. Having a higher level of P1NP tends to indicate more bone formation, which is a good thing. 
The P1NP helps assess the balance between how much bone is being formed and how much bone is being broken down. If your test results are not in the normal range, ask your doctor what it means and if there's anything that you can do about it. Next, let's go over two of the most commonly used bone resorption tests. Bone resorption refers to how much bone is being broken down in our bodies. The first of our bone resorption tests is the CTX, also known by its full name of C-terminal telopeptide of type 1 collagen. As its name implies, it's also measuring type 1 collagen, but instead of measuring bone formation, the CTX measures how much type 1 collagen is degrading. CTX levels rise in our bodies when they break down bone at a faster rate than usual. Having an elevated level of CTX signals that there's increased bone breakdown. Something to be aware of is that CTX levels rise past menopause because of the decrease in estrogen. Having a high CTX level is associated with having an increased risk for fractures. The CTX is used to help predict bone fragility and to better understand skeletal health overall. The CTX test can be taken from either a blood or a urine sample. Having this test done by blood is generally preferable because it tends to have less variability than a urine test. Blood samples also tend to be more stable for the CTX. If you choose to have a CTX performed, the normal range is between 104 and 1008 picograms per milliliter. This could also be expressed as being between 142 thousandths and 1 and 351 nanograms per milliliter. So your test can come in different measurements, just something to be aware of. Since CTX levels change throughout the day, this test is often scheduled for first thing in the morning. This test is usually given fasting for at least eight hours before the test is given. If you take medications, it may be necessary to stop those medications before having this test. So it's important to check with your doctor before the test to know what needs to happen for sure. The second bone resorption test that's commonly administered is the NTX, or known by its full name, the N-terminal telopeptide of type 1 collagen. The NTX is similar to the CTX in that they both measure bone breakdown. The NTX is frequently used to determine how well medication is working to stop the breakdown of bone. The NTX is also available as both a blood test and a urine test, but it's generally given and preferred as a urine sample. To provide an NTX urine sample, it's best to provide a sample fasting in the morning, and it's also generally as a second voiding of the day. The normal range for an NTX test for postmenopausal women is between 26 and 124 nanomoles of bone collagen equivalents per liter per millimole creatine per liter. And if you're wondering what creatine is, it's an energy source for our muscles. Having strong muscles contributes to having strong, healthy bones. Having a high level of NTX is an indication of bone that's breaking down. If your level is high, ask your doctor why it's high and if there's anything that you can do about it. Okay, so we've gone over four bone marker tests today, two bone formation tests and two tests that measure bone resorption or bone breakdown. We've also gone over what these tests show and how they help to understand bone health. I hope that this information is helpful and that it helps you to know both what tests to ask your doctor for and to further discuss with your medical provider what the results mean and what you can do about them. This video has quite a few scientific sources and if you'd like to check any of them out, they're available in the links down below this video. And if you found this video helpful, please share it with someone that you know and love. And on that note, I look forward to talking with you soon.